we have a, a next panel now, immediately after this one, and it's going to be on identifying innovative niche strategies, hedge fund managers describing risks and rewards in the current market environment. We'll have a Bob Serus from Wells Fargo, Bo Williams from Gallatin Loan Management, Alan Snyder from Shine Cook Partners, and Michael Roberts from Roberts Capital Advisors. Please come to the podium. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My, my background is just real quickly, uh, risk management, JP Morgan, then I've spent over 30 years on the investment side. Uh, CIOs on both sides, which is interesting. So I've been traditional, uh, at, most recently with Cantor Fitzgerald as their CIO on the wealth side, and previously to that, I was basically Julius Baer, CIO on alternatives. So I've invested probably over 10 billion in direct and probably more on the advisory side. And I have a very senior panel here, so maybe they can introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Alan Snyder. Um, one thing, I clearly can't hold a job. Years ago, I, I grew up on Wall Street and ended up running most of the product areas for a firm that's now called Morgan Stanley. Started the Discover car there with a few other people, toddled around, went out west to get my head handed to me to restructure uh, California's largest insurance company. And I started a family office when I quit Wall Street, which is what we're working on today. Uh, I could go on, but I don't want to bore you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Michael Roberts. I'm the founder and chief investment officer of Roberts Capital Advisors. Uh, our firm is an absolute return uh, fund manager, and we use big data to monitor companies and the economy in real time. I'm Bo Williams, um, partner and um, uh, CEO of a firm called Gallatin Loan Management. We operate in the high-yield credit space, uh, mostly managing and issuing um, CLOs, collateralized loan obligations, which are effectively um, uh, little banks or little uh, sort of closed-end specialty finance vehicles, which take um, as assets the senior financing from LBOs, uh, and then we sell liabilities out in the market and create an arbitrage. Um, I started in banking at Goldman Sachs, moved over into the uh, high-yield distress world at a place called Marathon Asset Management, um, and then have been um, working in high-yield credit uh, ever since. We actually had a predecessor company, um, which we sold to Fortress in 2016 uh, because of some regulatory changes, and then um, went on a little retreat and decided that we could set up and efficiently bring capital into our business by being based in Puerto Rico. So we set up our new business in Puerto Rico a year and a half uh, ago and have been there since, um, uh, the whole time focused on uh, high yield credit. Thank you, guys. And we have an interesting topic, so niche strategies within the hedge fund alternative space, but I wanted to address a little bit about the current market environment, and we're all a little stressed right now. Uh, the market has been selling off. There's been an increased level of volatilities across the board. You know, part of that is to do, you know, with what's happening in Europe. Part of it to do with midterm elections risk here. And I also think part of it to do is basically valuations has been a little bit higher than they were several years ago. And that's the increased risk. So if you look at the overall market returns through the end of last Wednesday, and but the S&P is still up 3%. The Barclay Ag, which is a surprise to a lot of people, but not to myself, with the duration sensitivity, is down 2.4%. Hedge funds in general have held up pretty well. Um, the overall HFR weighted index composites up 1.4% through that time period. Relative values up 3%. Macros down 1.8, and Vent driven is 2.8, and equity long shorts 1.7. And you know, I would say overall those are some pretty good strong returns. Yeah, any views on that in terms of any surprises or overall views about the hedge fund space? I think it's very hard to find good places to invest today. If you look at most yield instruments, almost universally across the board in the first nine months of the year, they're all negative, every single one. Mortgage banks, munis, et cetera, uh, probably functionally related to duration. Uh, looking forward, not so much looking back, BlackRock, I don't know if any of you have seen it, if you want it, I can send it to you, it publishes their outlook. You talk about depressing, oh my goodness. Uh, US credit, they estimate in the next five years will generate about a 2.8% return. 
high yield, a little higher, an inch higher. Equities, uh, huge volatility they're projecting, a 5% uh, average compound return, not very cheery. Um, so pretty challenging as you think, all right, where the hell do I invest today? Um, and hedge funds have had their share. By the way, they project for hedge funds, as I look at this, uh, for the next five years, they, this is an average, a 4% yield. Ouch. I, I, think it's, I, I think it's definitely been a challenging environment. Um, for across all asset classes, and that's what's been different, uh, particularly this year, um, as opposed to prior years, is that there are very few standouts um, this year. Now, what we experienced, though, in October, um, it's important to put everything in context. And um, what, what's quantifiable, at least, and the, the story that's quantifiable is that there was a short-term liquidity crunch um, caused, in part, at least, by... Um, tremendous issuance of short-term treasury, uh, treasuries in August. And what happened was uh, a lot of levered strategies, such as risk parity strategies, saw their costs go up, and at the same time, uh, their assets, uh, mostly uh, in treasuries, uh, treasury bonds, start to fall. And um, so that they had two choices. One thing, one choice was they could invest more in equities, because equities at the time uh, were rallying. Uh, but the other choice, uh, which is what they eventually did, was just to liquidate as soon as the equity market started to uh, decline at the, towards the end of September and early October. And so it's been an interesting landscape. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why it's been such a challenging environment for, for hedge funds is because you've got, and for all types of strategies, it's because you know, sh short-term um, trouble within the credit markets is actually um, cascading into other markets like equities. I mean, the only thing I'll add, and um, you know, tooting our own horns here a little bit, is that um, uh, you know people tend to be overexposed to the you know mainstream asset classes. Uh, so inherently, the, um, the the niche classes um, you know provide you some diversification, some uncorrelated exposure, um, and that's you know uh, some of all of what what we do, and um, and so you know. Part of what we're here to talk about clearly is you know, why we think it makes sense, especially in times like this, to you know to have some exposure. And you know the, the flip side of that is it can be frustrating um, if you are a guy like us um, who focuses on a niche strategy when things are great, when things are booming, when the S and P is up 30 percent. Everyone says, you know, why are you farting around with this dumb little stuff? And I don't really understand it. Returns aren't that great, and I can just park in a zero fee S&P ETF and make 30%. Sometimes it's true and sometimes it's not. And clearly October was a little reminder um, that uh, yeah, it may make sense to diversify a little bit. So. Yeah, I do think it makes a lot of sense. And we've been all big proponents of the alternative space for a long period of time at all the panels here. And I'm pretty sure most of the crowd has. Um, at times, it has been disappointing uh, from 2008 on. The returns have, have been lackluster. But you're in a period whereby you have more uh, dispersion and opportunity set, and I think it is a kind of strategy, kind of tactical allocation type of market. And that makes sense for what we're going to talk about a little bit about niche type of strategies. And maybe Alan could start maybe just defining it a little bit more. I'm a niche bigot. I think they're probably the best places to invest today. Uh, when I was restructuring the insurance company, we had $18 billion in high-yield bonds. That was quite a challenge. But we had $2 billion in alternatives and mostly niche investments. For example, I'll give you one. We were the largest owners of post offices in the U.S. Here we're talking about fantastic trade. Government leased, well-positioned, highly leverageable. Fantastic trade. Niches, what are they? There's a wall around the space, typically. There's a unique competency of whoever's executing it. Generally, if the person executing it, it, it creates a defensible position. Usually, good news or bad news for large pools of capital, typically they're smaller. It's the antithesis of a crowded trade. Generally, everything correlates at one at some point, but generally they're uncorrelated. 
and the returns are generally higher with greater consistency. Warms the cockles of my black heart. <laughs> There's so much more to ask about that, but we'll leave that alone. <laughs> Hey, 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 can, you, can you top that? Hey, 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 how can I add <laughs> anything to that? <laughs> well, anything? I mean, the, the only other thing I'd add, and, and uh, I'll include this a little bit, is um, the, just to take the flip side for one second. Um, clearly, watching you know capital flows um, is probably the you know the one thing that you have to worry about, and so thinking about the liquidity or sort of you know redemption structure or so forth around um, these strategies is important because inherently it's a niche and so if capital does come pouring in then things can get out of whack and vice versa if capital goes you know running away um, that's a whole other set of issues maybe you can expand upon that a little bit you know well, just from a liquidity and leverage standpoint and sure uh, overall when you look back from a historical standpoint you would say they're uncorrelated there are periods of stress, yeah. and the correlation doesn't really work as you expect. Yes. Um, yes and no. Yes and no. Yes, yes, yes and no. So um, the, the the yes is kind of obvious because you know that can be the case. The no is, and certainly one thing in the securitization world, um, and part of what you know I end up spending a lot of my time, uh, my day doing, is trying to explain to people who can kind of take the time and parse through the difference between what we do, which is fundamentally packages of senior loans, um, versus a lot of the toxic. Uh, acronyms that helped blow up the world in 2008, and whether that's um, ABS, CDOs, or MBS, and other uh, securitizations, uh, the, the fundamental issue was um, it was one of two things. One, either the collateral that was in there um, was fundamentally dramatically overvalued, um, uh, or you know deeply subordinated, and so uh, putting it together and having uh, a you know larger pool of uh, junk didn't make it any less junky. Um, uh, the, the other piece is the kind of um, mark to market or sort of margin impact, and that's and that's just a a pure structural element. Whereas uh, in what we do in CLOs, for example, if they're non mark to market, and so even if there are outflows and so forth, your capital doesn't get pulled away from you. You know, when somebody signs up for, you know, one of these securitizations, they're in until it goes away. Whereas there's other types of vehicles where all of a sudden if there are outflows and there's a change in, um, uh, in you know, capital coming in or out of the asset class, then that can uh, boomerang to you, in which case, you know, you have to deal with the redemptions. And, and whether, it's, um, whether it's what I'm talking about or, uh, you know, hedge funds or you know, any, I don't care what it is, but any sort of structure where just inherently there's short-term redemption pressure can translate into the manager having to then, you know, quickly liquidate. Again, it's what happened in October. Um, it happens every day in various different contexts, but that's what can go on. What, what makes a niche investment interesting is the idea that it... Uh, is the capability of it to deliver in all markets, and um, you know, and so it's, it's not the fact. And it's sometimes that can be explained in terms of uncorrelated. Sometimes it's it's not. But what makes it niche is the fact that you're thinking about an idea, that you're thinking about an investment differently from other people in the market, and um, and that the returns should give you uh, a different return stream than other types of asset classes. One thing I think about niche investing is it takes enormous amounts of due diligence. Uh, it really rewards successful due diligence. There was a, a French uh, medieval philosopher that sort of sums it up for me, uh, Peter Abelard by name. He said, by doubting, we are led to questioning. By questioning, you can arrive at the truth. And so since we write a fair amount at Shinnecock, on our websites, a whole long laundry list of due diligence questions, due diligence things to undertake in examining any investment, but with particular application to niche investments, which frequently are also emerging managers uh, that enter the space. Not always, but frequently. So I would argue in your risk question, due diligence is paramount. And uh, while I might kid Bo a little bit, 
I'm not as convinced that the liquidity has to be terrible in niche investments. I think it, it can be pretty good, uh, particularly if it's short duration, uh, the underlying whatever it is. I agree. I agree. What I'm amazed at, I've been doing this for a very long period of time, and I've analyzed, as I mentioned before, traditional alternatives. I've probably met with over a thousand external managers and done due diligence, both from investment due diligence and operation due diligence standpoint. But you're out there and you find something new all the time. There's a new strategy or style, and it could be you know, sector focus or regional focus, or it can be a tweak in terms of how you get the data. I, I find it incredibly fascinating. So what I'd like to talk about maybe is maybe some of your ideas on the niche side and examples of them, and if you could kind of flush them out in a little more detail. Would you like to start first? <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, I guess one of the best places I know of to invest today is alternative lending, think non-bank lending. I would argue the consistency of returns, we've been doing it for some time, are incredibly compelling. You can do it with very short duration. As an example, you can create a portfolio with 16-month duration, terrific in a ra rising rate market, and you'll get somewhere, depending on your liquidity needs, somewhere between 7.5 and 8.5% yield. When uh, high-yield bonds are yielding 3, that would, those returns would eclipse the equity markets without the uh, hair-raising drawdowns. Now, drilling down deeper, I could go on at length about all the different flavors of alternative lending. Uh, there are myriad numbers of them. It's a $51 trillion space, according to Goldman Sachs. So it's counterintuitively bigger than you think. And the place that uh, has captured our imagination today, we've been investing in the space for the last few years, is uh, He'll laugh. Uh, lending against fine art. Secured lending. I think it's the neatest thing since Wheaties. Picture this. You're lending against something that's been auctioned, so you have a hard price discovery. We take delivery of the art in a bonded warehouse, possession being nine-tenths of the law. The seasoned portfolio is six to nine months in duration, and you're getting about a nine plus yield. I mean, I love it. I think it's very, very compelling. At, at a 50% loan to value ratio. Very interesting. Mike, would you mind talking about something? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think one of the biggest, uh, one of the most interesting areas right now is, you know, in line with what this conference is about, which is alternative data. Um, you know, never before we have, we had access to this much information before. And never, and so, and there's so many people trying to do so many different things um, that, and, and it's, as I think there's going to be huge, um, there are going to be tremendous benefits uh, will, will accrue to the folks who can figure it out and who've been there uh, at least since the beginning. And so, um, it never before, and what's so interesting about it is that's the way the world is moving. And, and what I mean by that is, more and more people, more and more firms, more and more uh, governments are doing transactions online um, that we can see. And that gives us incredible uh, information that uh, we've never had before. And so I think there's a, I mean, a, there's a tremendous opportunity uh, in the alternative data space. Do you have a specific example, maybe, uh, you know, of an idea, or, and that also, <laughs> yeah. and there's, yes, and, and, absolutely. Course, but, and I, I gave you a softball. Yeah. I gave you a softball, but, you know, does that mean that um, it's it's the time horizon is a little bit shorter for your type of area? Well, yeah, I, I think one of the benefits of it is um, the alternative data space tends to also be very liquid, and so um, and so you don't have to, and so if you if you invest and you just decide it's not for you, you can get out. And so, and that's, um, and so you can dip your toe in the water without being worried uh, that you can't get out of uh, a position. So, um, I, I, I think it's a great space. Okay. And, and Bo, could you have an example maybe? Sure. In um, your area? 
Well, we, we think the, the core um, CELO equity product is pretty interesting um, right now. And, um, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're biased, but fundamentally it's a non-mark to market arbitrage where you basically, um, you know, have a low mid teen type return expectation. And if the manager can really perform and avoid defaults or maximize recoveries, maybe it's more like, you know, mid high. And um, if they're, uh, you know, it's a higher default kind of environment and recoveries aren't quite as good, um, maybe it's, um, you know, mid high single digits rather than low mid teens. Um, but we think to have kind of that range is, um, is pretty attractive. And this is a product that, you know, pays every 90 days. So we think that um, that makes a lot of sense for people to have that kind of exposure in their portfolios. One, one little sub nuance, so niche within the niche, if you will, is, um, uh, is actually what happens right before the securitization closes. You call it a, we call it a warehouse facility. So the bank who's arranging the securitization basically gives you some time to build up the pool uh, before the whole securitization closes. And uh, it's the same assets, it's the same um, type of risk, except it's inherently very short term. It's somewhere between two and six months for the most part. And um, again, it's a um, kind of low mid-teen type return expectation um, with, the, with the caveat that um, in the warehouse, it gets taken out by the securitization. So the only thing that you really have to worry about is the securitization not happening. Um, clearly, the arranging bank is motivated to make it happen. They're the lender. Um, and so this kind of is one of those examples of it's very uncorrelated, um, except because you know what's the correlation between the securitization market breaking down and not happening? It's not tied to you know daily movement on the S and P or the Lehman Ag or anything like that, but uh, it is tied to sort of broad market distress. So if the whole market falls apart, then maybe that becomes a little bit of an issue. In which case, you go back to the fundamentals of looking at the uh, uh, the portfolio, uh, what you have there, and deciding if you want to keep it open or liquidate it. Um, but again, it's a uh, a relatively short term with kind of, you know, one risk uh, that you have to watch, but that you can watch and sort of isolate and kind of focus on very much um, to prevent you from making that kind of low mid-teen. I, I got to weigh in because these guys are all much smarter than I am. And Bo and I have talked about this. Warehouse lending against uh, CLO securitization, we participate in today. And it's a terrific investment, as Bo said. Think about it. If it's two to six, maybe even nine months, and you want out, don't renew. Terrific. Uh, one last one I got to interject here on uh, alternative lending. Picture this for all the steely-eyed investors in the crowd. I think this is truly compelling. We find loan originators. We say to them, look, here's the underwriting criteria we want for any loans that you source were usually tougher than their underlying business. If they source loans against that specification, we say, great, we'll put them in a special purpose vehicle, insulating it from any problems from the loan originator. We then loan against the special purpose vehicle. Now, a critical wrinkle, which is why I think it's uh, very compelling. We say to the loan originator, we don't want to be anti-selected against. So, you have to put up somewhere between 15 and 30% first loss capital. Now, there's a cushion. And the yield on this is somewhere, depending on the type of deal, somewhere between 10 and 18% with a first loss stopper. Um, we like investing in that. So, it sounds pretty positive on the niche side. A lot of opportunities and obviously there's some risks, but they're calculated and you can wall them off a little bit. So I would open it, you know, we do have some more things we're going to cover, but just, you know, related to time, maybe we could open it up to questions. Really talking about technology and the tools that technology is bringing. And we were talking today, Bo, you were talking about the concept of illiquidity and those of us going after alternative investments that don't have an active secondary market. Where... Are you guys getting excited about what technology is potentially doing for liquidity on these types of illiquid investments? Do you not care? Are you curious? Are those business lines that you guys are considering, how does it, how does it play into your daily basis? Technology creating liquidity for Ill typically illiquid investments. 
Go well, ahead. you know, it, it's a very, it's a great question, and um, and I think it's apropos. I'm sitting next to to Michael here, uh, because for us, um, it's a little bit less of technology uh, changing fundamentally the liquidity of of the investment, um, because uh, the the loans that that we trade are um, are traded over the counter and are maybe the one of the most antiquated instruments in the um, in the the general investment world today. Um, but the banks love it because that ensures that they keep their uh, position, so don't see them changing it. I mean, we literally joke every day about how great it would be if loans, we could trade loans through blockchain, and it's like, it would be absolutely fantastic, makes a ton of sense, and it will never happen. Um, but what we do think about a lot is how, like Michael, we can get information other than the quarterly you know, earnings that companies put out. And clearly, there are very smart people who are doing it, and there's a million different ways that you can do it as well. Um, and there's all, it's a kind of a funny zone because you know, algorithms and technology can help you with that. Um, and then you had things like the, you know, the Gerson Lermans of the world, and people sort of went not a technology route, but just another sort of information finding you know, sort of route. Um, and there's some issues with kind of those things, but it's, um, you know, the name of the game is information and figuring out how to get the best information, figuring out what information is relevant is, um, is, is part of what I think everyone has to do every day. Uh, two, two things come to my mind about answering the question. One, when I was on, in the Wall Street business, we got involved in, of course, margin, margin of securities. We ran across a very interesting company that provides margin against cryptocurrencies. And their technology really does give them liquidity because they do an instant mark, since the markets are open for Bitcoin, Ripple, Ethereum. And the markets, as you know, got crushed in uh, January, February, et cetera. It went down 75%. And because of their technology, they had no problem against the margin they were supplying. That's one, I think, really on-point example. Uh, and they're making a fair amount of money. Second one, I think, is pretty interesting, having uh, the bruises to prove it of being in the life insurance business. Uh, life settlements. How many people here are familiar with life settlements? Some. I think it can be a great investment, but you need scale. The player that I think, having looked at eight or 10 of them, manages two and a half billion dollars, and they have enormous amounts of technology to price the policies, make an assessment as to how long they'll be paying premium before the ultimate maturity and they get a death benefit. Um, and they use technology very effectively. Uh, which is very hard for a small life settlement player to do. So that would be another a specific example. Yeah, and, and I would just add really uh, quickly, you know, when I started Alternatives with an individual named Nicholas Bergroen back in 97, we had about 46 external investments across the whole hedge fund spectrum. And we had very little data. We had market letters. It was hard to get performance. You kept the performance and some simplistic database at the time. Pertrack was a system that was just starting. Outside of that, it was Excel. And so that's just performance data. You didn't even have the look-through information you know, to the managers at all. And I would guess at that time, the managers had a very difficult time getting details as well. And now we're looking forward 20 years, and if anything, the data is huge, and I think your point is well, um, well taken. I mean, the ability to go through that, you know, analytics and pull the information out, and to be able to use it in a timely and effective fashion. Any other questions? Okay. These gentlemen will be here later. I will as well, and thank you very much. Thank you.